record on this computer. Okay. Hello. Uh, so this is a video about salsa, and in particular, going just a little more in depth than the introductory video on how salsa works. The goal is to kind of give you an understanding of what salsa is doing when you actually invoke a query, so that you can use it more effectively. Um, and here to ask, make sure that I to keep me honest. Let's say is Jonathan Turner. Uh, hey, hi. <laughs> and the idea is uh, when I say really confusing things, he can tell me that they, I need to explain more. Um, so I think he's, he falls in that, that point of that position right now of a salsa user who doesn't know how the internals work. Um, so how does salsa work internally? Um, so let, let, let's, set up, let's set the scene. Let's imagine you have like a salsa query group and some trait. I'm just gonna go grab an example here from the prior paper. Suppose we have this, uh, this parser trait. Um, and I guess we need the inputs too. So let's review it. So what we've got is we have, we have two query groups, but I'm gonna put, I'm just gonna collapse this into one because the distinction isn't important for how it also works internally. So we have two inputs, a manifest and a source text. And we have two derived queries, the AST and the whole program AST. And for each of those, we're gonna have some function. Um, which defines how they work. Uh, the AST function is going to start by invoking the source text to get a string out. And so the source text is a string because that's how the query is defined right here. Um, and it's going to do some actual work on the source text and, and return it. And the whole program AST is going to iterate and invoke the AST query each time for a given name uh, and combine them in some way. And is there something else? Oh, no. Well, and I, this, just, just for reference, this is what the database looks like. Uh, you'll, you'll define a database, and there's probably some loop here where I instantiate the database. I set the inputs, I invoke type check, and I set the text. So let's start here and walk through just a, a little bit of detail. Just on this first line, my database default, you know, what's happening here. Um, so the way, when, the idea, uh, when salsa executes, it needs to have, it needs to keep track of the values that, that resulted from all the previous like queries that you did in the prior execution. That's basically how we avoid redoing work is by remembering like what was the AST of this file in the first iteration and so forth. And all of that data winds up being stored inside the salsa runtime. Um, and that, and it's, that's what these storage, uh, names here are basically doing that you attach to the database is that's it's going to keep those structs or keep values associated with those structs that has like a hash map essentially for every query that you have to execute. Right, so, Nika. Yep. <laughs> is that how we jump in? Boop. Perfect. Um, for the uh, for each of those, the let's see, yeah. So input storage, parser storage, and type checker storage. Are those defined? Do we did we define those then uh, earlier? Yes. So each of these corresponds to one query group, and they're defined by the query group. They're, they're, this is an actual name of a struct, uh, and this struct is generated by this decorator sort of attribute macro. And what the struct has is for each of the queries in that query group, it has the actual storage. Um, so by indirecting through this struct. Like you don't name the individual queries here, you name the struct and inside the struct or the query. So this, the struct for type checker storage is gonna have one hash map for the type check query, but the struct for parser is gonna have two, one for the AST and one for whole program AST and so forth. Got it. Um, and they're slightly different. So for the inputs, there will also be a kind of hash map, but it's a slightly different uh, wrapper around it because inputs work a little differently. But, um, but basically, per each query, you have the storage, which is, which is a map. Um, and so that all gets concatenated into the database. Uh, and when you call something like set manifest, what's happening under the scenes is that, let's say we, we call it with an M1 or something. Uh, what's happening under the scenes is that that data is, is getting stored into the map. Um, 
And it's because of the name set underscore manifest. Right. I, 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 I take it that that name is special in some way. Uh, for each input, for every salsa input that you define, there's okay. a setter automatically generated. Oh yeah, I see the comment now. Got it. Yeah. So that you can't call set AST because it's not an input. You can only ask for the AST and it gets computed. Um, so, right, so let, so, okay, this, this isn't really that relevant. Um, these might be topics for future salsa discussions, but the, so let's already take a few notes here. So like the database storage. So the database has, as I said, internally a shared storage with kind of one struct per query group, which has any of the structs have one field per query, one hash map, basically. I'll call, call it a map because it's, it is a hash map, but it's also other stuff. One map per query. And when you do db.set something, what you do is you basically, let, let's say on, let's make it more concrete. If I set input file, you know, uh, a.rs, I don't know, a little, a little rust source text there, then what I'm basically doing is storing into the input file map with the key a.rs and the value given, right? Um, I'm also doing one other thing because the database has internally a revision, which is really just a counter. It starts out at R0. And when I do that, every time I call set, I'm going to increment the revision. So in this case, I would go to R1. And we're going to see later that we need this revision to, to remember basically when did we compute for derived queries and things. We want to remember um, when did this last change, essentially. And so actually when I store into this, I don't just put the value given. I also store the revision R1, the new revision, when I set an input. So I'm remembering now this value was last changed as we entered revision 1. Right? And we're going to up the revision each time we do a set. So when we set the manifest, or when we set, if we called set input file twice, we would go to revision twice, revision 2. Just um, out of curiosity, revisions make me think of databases, and databases make me think of things like transactions. So each one of these calls is kind of a its own transaction. You can't group them into a single one. Just that's yeah. right. That's right. So we we guarantee that when you when you execute a derived query, like a type check query, which we'll get to in a second, that's going to do a whole bunch of work. But um, while it's executing, that's like a transaction. There can't be any sets that come in between. And actually, you, you kind of get that guarantee to a certain extent for free through Rust's system because this is an ANSELF method, uh, shared, so it has a shared reference, which means that you can't get a mutable reference at the same time. And these set methods, the setters, are and mute self, so they can't kind of overlap with db.typecheck. Um, but that's also really important for our uh, algorithm, basically. It would be really confusing if in the middle of executing the revision was changing. Um, and you even have a sort of explicit mechanism, which I didn't talk about in the other, I didn't talk about it and I won't talk about it in great depth, but given a DB handle, I think the method is called freeze, I forget. You can get a second handle, or no, I think I called it snapshot. And this second handle basically lets you do a number of, you can use it just like a database, but you can't do any set operations. And it, it's effectively, a, it keeps the database in a frozen state while it exists. Um, and then it's really meant to be sent to another thread and processed in parallel. And it's exactly this idea that while that thread is executing, it does not want, uh, it wants to execute atomically with respect to the database. And there's, just to be clear, there's no way of saying start transaction, then do these five edits, and then stop transaction. Like you're just assumed to do one edit at a time. That's right. And edits okay. can only happen on the main thread anyway. You can't get, ah. you can't clone the DB. You can only f snapshot it, which freezes it. So there's sort of no need for a transaction because there could be nothing that intervenes. Um, so, all right. So that's the database concept. Um, let's look a little bit more at this query storage. So I mentioned that for an input query, effectively you have a map like this. Um, that says, given a key, I'll give you a value and a revision, um, which is when the value was set. 
for a derived query, we have, there's actually a bunch of options here, but I'm just going to explain like the main, the normal one. <laughs> and I'll probably forget something. We may, we may come back to this, but this is the, the basic idea. Um, what is this? Uh, verified at and changed at. So we have actually two revisions. So a derived value would be something that we compute by doing a, um, by running a function, right? And I'll, I'll come back to the struct, like the details of this, but let's, let's first just sort of walk through. If you called, let's say, db.ast for some file, what's going to happen here at a high level is we will check to see if we have a memoized value already. And if so, we will clone that value and return it. Just for people that haven't heard the term memoized before? Uh, right. So basically, did we already execute this query? And if so, we will stash a copy of the result. That's the memoized value. It's like you wrote a little memo to yourself with what the result was. And then the next time you use it, you can just clone it. And you already, you can kind of see here something important, which is that the type really matters. So I, I, I define these queries as returning an AST. And if that were some big struct that's kind of expensive to clone, like maybe it has deep ownership of all of its uh, stuff, then that's not so great because every time we invoke db.ast, we're going to clone it. We've got, an, we've always got, oops, we always have at least one clone because we're keeping the old value here. Um, so, so what you really want there is to have, maybe, maybe you want to put it in arc or something like that. I'm not going to worry about that right now, but similarly string and so forth might not be the best choices. Um, you really want keys and values to be, cheaply clonable. So, but in any case, we'll check to see if there's a memoized value. If there is no memoized value, uh, this is like the basic algorithm, I guess. Then we invoke the function db, or ast, db8.rs. So essentially here, we're gonna call the function that you defined, we'll see it in a second. We'll give it the database, we'll give it the keys. Sometimes there's more keys, right now there's only one. Um, and then we will take the return value. So this would be like let e. Then take the return value. We'll store v into the map. With uh, note that here, when we do this, we're actually going to clone the keys too. So that's why I say both should be clonable. We'll store v into the map, um, and we'll we'll put the. Ignore, I'm going to ignore the dependencies part for a second. We're going to put the value, you know, with, with the key, a dot rs. The value is uh, the value is v and the verified at or the change at is going to be the current revision whatever that is and so will the verify and what that's basically saying is the last time we computed this was we remember what the revision was so let's say it's r1 for now um or r2 i guess because we said we called two setters um so we went to a revision r2 here so now we know that in r2 we computed this AST and this was what it looked like. Um, and I think that's a really great high level overview of what's happening, but maybe we can talk a little bit about that AST function. Like what is it returning from that, that function that's going into V that we're then storing into the map later? Right. So the AST function, that's, that's literally this function that, that the user defined here. Mm -hmm. So it's returning whatever this function returns. Oh, okay. um, and uh, because we're sort of generating all this code with macros and things, uh, uh, or generics and so forth as necessary, the types all line up. Um, mm -hmm. And right, so, so that once we call here, this is really the user's code. We, have, we, don't, we don't do anything. Um, so that would call, that would internally, if, if we walk through what that's going to do in this case, it's going to call db.sourcetext. So we've given it our database right here as one of its parameters. Um, and actually I wrote, here I wrote database, but I'm going to write self because this is effectively the, this is like when, this is the definition for the actual method. Um, like in other words, we're kind of defining uh, the name of this trait so oh, I was a little inconsistent. But we'll just call it example. Give it a very good name. My query group. Um, 
we're basically defining this, what we're saying here, this algorithm, this is essentially what, uh, what the database is actually going to do when you call AST. Oh, okay. Um, sometimes invoke. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, right. So we go back here and here we see that in, while we're running the user's code, it actually calls source text, right? And source text is an input. Um, so inputs behave a little differently. When you, when you invoke an input, what happens uh, is, is much simpler. Essentially, you just look it up in the hash map <laughs> and, return, and clone the result. Um, but again, you see we're cloning, so it's important to not be too expensive. But so when we call db.source text, that's, that's literally just a hash name. We'll look up with a little, a little bit of stuff around it that we'll get to in a second. Uh, but that's where we get the string from. And that the hash map is, re again, returning not just the value, but the revision and the value, which we'll, we'll uh, use that revision. Later. That's right. Internally, it is returning the both, both of them. But the revision doesn't make it all the way to the user. Right? We kind of intercept that. Um, and right, so OK. So if you didn't have any revision tracking, this is actually more or less how the system works. Um, and you see that the, now you can sort of see what the memoize happens because if we call db.ast twice, the first time we invoke the function, the second time we have a value so we can just return it. The only thing that I would add onto this is, that's kind of important, is actually before we do any of this, we check for a cycle. Um, and that means that while you're computing db or the AST for a given file, you can't recursively ask for the AST for that file because we don't know what to give you, essentially. Um, and in that case, we panic. Uh, so you're really not supposed to, to do that. <laughs> you have to kind of set up your queries so they don't cycle. And it, in, in Rusty itself, these panics get, we kind of capture the stack trace and print them out to the user as user errors saying your source code is messed up. Uh, in some cases, but um, so right, uh, but now we can kind of start to add the revision tracking, I guess. Um, so the idea with the revision tracking is when we next call, if if we when we next call a setter, it's going to up the revision. And so now, when we look at this memoized value, we really want to check. Check if the verified at um, field is equal to the current revision. And if so, we can return it. So now we said, was this basically, was this verified at is telling us, is this value, do we know that it's correct give in this revision, given the state of the inputs in this revision? Right? So if that's the current revision, then we're done. Um, and that's still going to work the same for the memoizing. But if it's not, if it's older, like let's say that means that an input has changed since this revision was done, then we want to see, like, basically figure out if we can reuse the value or not. And that's what we'll dig into a bit. Um, to do that, we have to go back one step. While we were actually computing the value, uh, we were doing a little bit more behind the scenes. We were also tracking what queries you did uh, and recording them in a step, basically recording them as the dependencies. Uh, so um, the way we do that tracking is, well, for, well, first of all, so like in this case, what that would mean for AST is we would get back a result. When we, uh, we'll get back two things here. We'll get back the value and we'll get back the dependencies. And the dependencies would be like a vector. In this case, uh, what did we call source text? So we have this concept, which is you don't directly interact with it, but it's called the database key. Um, and basically what it is, if the query key, if the key for a query is just this string, the arguments to the query basically, and the database key is kind of the pair of the query name and all of its arguments. So it kind of uniquely identifies one bit of computation. Um, and so, so a dependencies, the dependencies list is just is like a vector of database keys. Um, 
And in this case, we would have, okay, in the course of, of computing the AST, we accessed the source text. Uh, and we'll store that along with the value. And this kind of works because when we're invoking the query and that query invokes another query, because of the magic of macros, we can we have some visibility into what is like that second query. We can see that that's getting invoked by the first one. Yeah, so let me, it's not really a magic of macros per se, but um, we have in the database, we know what is the currently active query. We actually mm -hmm. know the whole stack, which is how we check for a cycle in the first place. Um, so what we can do is the first thing we do when you enter into any operation is we record this as a dependency of the currently active query. So like also here, um, we would record, so for this is, let's say this is db.source text. We would record source text as a dependency. And similarly, finally here, we have to kind of push onto the currently active query stack, um, the push a fresh, sort of a fresh record onto the currently active query stack. Um, and here we would pop it off. That's kind of actually how we get the dependencies out as we pop off the record, extract the dependencies from it. And so really it's not returned to us. It's, um, it's something we recorded while we, while AST was executed. Uh, and right. So that we have that. We also track one other thing as we go, which is we track the, the maximum revision uh, at which any of the things we did changed. So we mentioned that in the source text, we're gonna clone the result and return the associated revision. Um, so track the maximum change revision. So for example, when we call AST, well, when we, in this case, we're only, we're only doing one thing. So the maximum revision would just be whatever, basically whatever revision the source text changed in, we'll, re, we'll bring that back with us. Um, and we use that later. So, okay, so now we have information now we can come back to figuring out if we can reuse the value. Now we have a list of dependencies that we, and this is basically all the, we assume that your derived query is a purely deterministic function. And that's kind of on you to get correct. But we assume that it's a function that if you give it exactly the same inputs, uh, then it will do exactly the same thing. Right? And that means, and by inputs here, I don't mean just the inputs to the, Salsa database as a whole, like source text, I really mean all the queries that it invokes are kind of its inputs, right? So here there's an input db.source text, but for the whole program AST query, manifest is an input, but so is sort of the result of this recursive call. Um, so we assume that it's deterministic and therefore we assume if none of the inputs have changed in this revision, then the result must not have changed in this revision either and we don't need to re-execute it. So what we can do is say something like, for each dependency we had before, let's call it D, um, did D change, or like look at the, is the change dat of D, which is the last provision where this thing changed, um, greater than or equal to the current revision? I guess it can't ever be greater than, equal to the current revision. Um, and if so, or yeah, if so break, I don't know, that's kind of annoying. Let's look at it more like this. <laughs> For all the dependencies is change that of D less than uh, the current revision, more or less. That's not quite right, but that's the idea. Uh, I probably mean the verified at. And if so, we can update verified at to the current revision. I probably, this is maybe a bit more detail. I'm sure I'm getting some of the exact logic here a little bit wrong, but the basic idea is we look at those, we know when those values changed and we can go over them and see, have they changed 
uh, in the current revision or not, and or or since the how have they changed since the last time we computed this value, basically. And if they haven't, then we can just say, well, the value is still good, and we can change the verified at field to say, well, at least in this revision, it was up to date, right? And the next time through, we don't have to redo this work again. But the change that we don't change, right? Because it didn't change its value. It's, it never changed it in revision, in the new revision. Uh, it's still the same value it was before. Um, so let's look at an example. I think that'll help a little bit. So if we say like we do db.setSource text or whatever I called it. I think I called it source text. Uh, something, this puts us in R1. Then let's say we set source text here to B, that puts us in R2. And then we invoke the parser on A, that's gonna give us a record that says, you know, I was verified at R2 and I changed at R2. And of course my dependencies is just A.RS. And then suppose that I set the source for B again. And now I'm in R3 and I re-invoke. Now nothing, none of this, none of the inputs for this function have changed in this new revision. So when we ask, I'll just go ahead and put the dependencies list. When we ask, when we go look at source text for a.rs and we ask when did it change, we're gonna get back R2. Or yeah, I'm sorry, R1 actually. We'll get back R1 because that's the last time a new value was set. And so we'll say, okay, we can just, we can just change this to R3. Um, we can leave changed at the way it was. We leave the dependencies the way it was because sort of if we had re-executed it, we would have gotten the same thing we got in R2. That's fine. Um, and I forget actually, it may, it may be that we actually store R1 here because I, m I mentioned we compute the maximum of all of our inputs. When did they change? I, I forget exactly how we do that, but either one would be correct at least for the algorithm, I think. It doesn't really matter as long as it's, uh, as long as it's, you know, recorded at this point because we only care about the future. <laughs> um, but the point is we know, go on. Can I jump in? Mm -hmm. um, maybe I can repeat back to you what I'm, I'm hearing you say and we can kind of double check that um, I got it so far. So we set source text on ARS and it, source text ARS is kind of that special key, that special key that will allow us to know if we've run this before in the past. Um, all right, so we, we remember that we've done that and we've set it at revision one. That's, that's the R1 or A.RS. Mm -hmm. Then we do set source text or B.RS, and that's a different file and a different key um, as a result. So because that string is different, we now have source text BRS in the database as well. And that's at R2. We don't touch, um, we don't touch any of the previous edits that we made at that point. So A.RS would still be at R1, even though now B.RS is still at R2. Yep. I guess that's the change that. So when we do the line three, db.ast, so now we're gonna do a query, we're not setting anything. We're just querying it back out. When we query out a.rs, we know to go look for um, its dependencies to be able to answer that. Um, we get that because as the query runs, we're, we're basically logging the steps that it's taking to answer that. Yes. Right. So at this time through, um, we, we watch it run because it's not cached yet. So we actually run the ASD function, we step through, we see it call the source text query, and when it does, we set that into the dependencies. It finishes running and gives us a value. And we know that we verified this at the most recent, which is R2, because everything just came out fresh. And the change is the most recent um, for that, for the query, I guess the, the I, don't, I can't remember what you call it. Oh, max chain revision is what you call it. So the max chain revision would be R1 in this case because everything that A.RS needs is in the first revision. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right so far? Yep, I'm trying to like note down some of the things you said here. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, that sounds exactly right. So, right. Um, oh yeah. So maybe we can keep going. If, if that sounds good so far. Right. Then... So I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Exactly. So change that R1 is basically that's the last time any input changed, right? So therefore, that must be if we went back in time into revision one and we executed, we should get the same result because we didn't right. look at any of the things that changed after that. Okay. And then we do a set source text on line four. We do a set source text of b.rs again. So this is the first time we're reusing one of our keys. Yes. The key was at R2, but now that we're editing it again, that's at R3. Yes. And on line five, you have asda.rs. So now we're, we're rerunning that query. We update the, I guess we update the verify because we're, we're saying, OK, we're at R3. I'm, I'm checking everything again. At R3, this is where we're at. Um, everything's still at R1. We don't have to rerun any of the query. None of the dependencies changed at this point. So we can just give you the cached value or the memoized value. Yep. And so to walk through this, just to touch more detail, on entry, we will have this value. And in particular, this is out of date because the current the current revision is R3, but we saw that this was last verified in R2. So it might there might be a problem. We don't know yet. And then we can iterate over the dependencies and basically ask them right, uh, when they last changed. And in this case, there's exactly one input dependency. So it's very easy to tell when it last changed. We just look it up in the hash map. Um, and so the most recent version is R1. And so we conclude then that nothing changed that affects us. So we just uh, update, verify that, the current revision. Because that's the last time we, we checked it. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's the idea um, so far. There's one twist we haven't gotten to yet. Um, one other, well, there's two things we didn't talk about that are relevant, I think. The first one is, I only showed you when you have a direct dependency, which is a, an input. That's very easy. Um, in the case where the dependency is not an input, but rather a derived thing, then we sort of have to recursively do this procedure. So let's say the whole program AST invokes, the, invokes one of its AST dependencies uh, we want to find out if it's up to date in this revision. And it's the same basic idea, but it's a slightly different variation on it. Um, so before we actually dive into that, which sounds really interesting, there's um, maybe we can take this example and go a little bit further in this particular example mm -hmm. so we can see the interaction yeah. between the, the, the memoizing and the edits. So right now we're, we're editing b.rs. And that's not affecting a.rs. We still get the same memoized version of a.rs. But if we set the source text of a.rs, you know, after this block. Yep. Yeah. Actually, I think I think that you are totally correct. We should continue with this example. And the thing I was going to say, you said sounds very interesting. I think it actually isn't that interesting. So we'll come back to it maybe. <laughs> but it's it's basically a variation on a theme. Uh, but let's let's look at this instead. Suppose Suppose that I call now a set source text on a.rs, but where I had function main with an empty body, I now change it. Oops, I lost my, where am I? Here I am. I now change it to have a space in the body, right? It's not a particularly important edit. It won't affect the parser at all, but we don't really know that. So what we're going to do is we're going to remap this to R4 because now we're in revision four. And now if I reinvoke db.ast, um, we have a prop. We'll, we'll have a sort of a problem in a sense. We're going to see that indeed, um, this should now be R3, I suppose. So we see that it was verified in R3. That's not R4, so it's out of date. So we have to check. We iterate over our dependencies, um, and we find that, hey, this actually did change in in our like since we last checked. Um, so now we have a problem. We're going to re-execute the AST method. 
But we're going to do one last twist that I didn't, we didn't write about in the algorithm yet. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to hold on to the old value that we had before, the old AST. Um, and we're going to get now the new value by re-executing. Uh, and then we can do a check and we can say, what happened? Did we actually, even though the inputs changed, did that result in a change in the return value or not? Because if it didn't change the return value, then nobody who is invoking us really cares. Um, essentially, the, yeah, it's not, it's not, that's assuming that, again, this deterministic nature. So what we can do is say, oh, in that case, update verified at, but leave changed at alone. Um, and if they did actually change, then we have to make a new record where update both verified at and changed at to current revision. So in this particular case, since we didn't change anything that will affect the parsed result, we actually wind up with um, verified at R4, but we leave changed at as R1. We, we kind of backdated our result. So even though we read something which changed in R4, uh, we can observe that the result is the same as it was in R1, so we can leave it alone. Um, so what is the, what does this help us do if we kind of backdate it like that? Yeah, it doesn't help us do anything in this example so far <laughs> because we still had to re-execute the AST method, right? So we still did all the work. However, if we go to the next level up and we invoke what did I call it? Whole program AST. Um, whole program AST. And let's assume that we actually, we also invoked it, you know, earlier, like here. Um, and we got some AST. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do is, for the sake of the historical record, I'm going to take this and copy it, because it's kind of a useful artifact, just as it is. And then in start injecting the whole program AST into it. So suppose that um, so this is, what is this like second generation derived queries? Um, so suppose that we invoked db whole program AST here before this last edit, right? And we got some, some results, some result W then now when we invoke, and let's say we didn't invoke db AST directly. So actually, okay, let's just make this a little more realistic. We set the source text. We invoked db dot whole program AST, and this in turn invokes db dot like internally invokes db dot AST dot RS and b dot RS. It also invokes the the manifest as it happens, and all this other stuff happens that we said before, um, and and we'll basically wind up with now something like verified at uh, R two I guess changed at I think R two. Um, and we have our dependencies list, which is all the other queries. So the dependencies list will be AST of A.RS, AST of B.RS. And, and, oh, ordering is important here. I don't want to, I'll just say that and leave it mysteriously unexplained. Um, but we have to record them in the order that they occurred because otherwise they're for, for reasons. Um, just out of curiosity, this is actually an interesting point. So the, the manifest, the ASDRS, and AST B.RS. We know from earlier in the conversation that AST also depends on the source text, but we don't, we're not flattening all the dependencies of, say, AST into this list, right? That's right. It's a shallow list. That's sort of AST to RS's problem, what its dependencies were. Um, yeah, yeah, so now we change the source text again, but all we did was add a space, and we re invoke whole program AST. And we have this question, can we reuse, can we reuse the result or not? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go over the dependencies list. Uh, and we'll look, so like for the manifest query, this has not changed. Well, actually we never set it at all. So same. I think that will actually cause salsa to panic if you read an input you never set, but let's assume it was in R0 or something. This, the point is it hasn't changed uh, since R2. So, this is fine, right? This is like exactly the case we saw with source text above. But now we get to ASTA.RS, 
And we're going to recursively ask it, because it's a derived query, we're going to sort of ask it, have you changed since R2? Right? And it's going to do the process we just talked about. It will look at, look at its own inputs. It will determine that they have det uh, it will determine that they have changed. It will re-execute and produce a new AST. It will compare the old and new AST, and it will see that they are the same. So it's going to leave. Therefore, it's going to be able to say, "No, I have not changed," because the changed at value is less than r less than or equal to r two, because it was able to backdate. If it hadn't backdated, it would have had to say, "Yes, I may have changed." Right, a more conservative result. If we didn't have the old value to compare against, for example. And in the case of ASTB.RS, no input has changed since R2, because we only set A.RS, not B. And therefore, this is trivially still valid. Um, well, trivial, I don't know, but that's the base case kind of. Uh, and so in the end, we determine the value is still valid, and we can just uh, update verify that and we never have to re-execute uh, and that's really nice because actually um, building the whole program ASD is perhaps I don't know significantly more expensive than just any one piece of it right so we were able to, to keep the end result that we all, that we really care about uh, that's that's basically the whole algorithm um, in all of its sides and the one thing I would mention is that uh, you can tweak this, and Salsa offers some knobs for this. I would like there to be more. So you could imagine, for example, that some queries might not keep the old value, in which case they have to be more conservative because they, don't have, they can't do this backdating trick. Um, and similarly, some queries might keep just a hash of the old value and not the actual value itself, in which case they can do the backdating if you assume it's like a cryptographic hash that you trust, but you can't you can sort of backdate yourself, but if someone directly invokes you, you don't actually have a value to return, so you still have to execute. So it's kind of these in-between points where you might be able to save, like we might be able to reuse the whole program AST, but if we find, if we were not if we were only keeping hashes of the AST, uh, then you know, if we do have to re-execute the whole program AST, we have to reparse everything, but we might be able to reuse the final end result. So there's, there's a bunch of knobs you can turn. Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. <laughs> Questions on this last part? Well, that sounds, that sounds good. Um, so this is kind of like how we, we can make our edits and then we can, as we develop a more sophisticated set of dependencies, we can be smarter about how we're caching whole, uh, whole parts of that graph or whole parts of that tree. So we don't, rerun a very deep set of dependencies and queries on top of queries. That's right. So add a note here for, for posterity. <laughs> um, yep. Uh, I don't know. Are we done? Maybe we're done. No. <laughs> so I stopped you before you got to another thing. Um, so we were talking about that original example, and I said, well, let's do some edits on, uh, or do another query on, say, ASTP.RS, and you're about to take us into a different direction about different kinds of queries, I think. I think I was going to talk about this procedure where one of your dependencies is itself a derived query, hmm. and I kind of hand-waved over it, but but basically, I, I, I asked this question, have you changed? There are sort of two fundamental things that a query has to be able to do. Um, it has to be able to give you a result that is up to date. And it has to be able to tell you if it has changed. And they're like similar, but slightly, ever so slightly different. Uh, and the, the reason that they're ever so slightly different is exactly that you might be able to figure out that you have not changed, even if you don't know what your value is, as I was kind of saying because you can see that none of your inputs have changed. Um, but so there's actually two kind of branches of the code for handling these two cases. For every query, we generate two methods. Um, and it, and in, what, in some cases, like here actually, 
when you ask, has it changed? If it finds that an input has changed, it will actually invoke the other method, the re-execute method. Um, so they kind of invoke each other back and forth. Um, because uh, producing a value has to check if the inputs have changed and then checking if the inputs have changed sometimes has to produce a value. Uh, but yeah, that's the idea. Okay. So we've been talking about using strings as keys and strings as values. Um, maybe it'd be helpful to talk about um, different kinds of data types that you can put into the database and query back out. And what are some good practices there? Yeah. All right. Well, we've got a little time. We'll go through our list. Check. OK, so we did this. <laughs> uh, right, so what makes a good key value type? So the short version is, or I mentioned that we have to do a lot of cloning. So really, vex and strings and stuff are, are possibly not a good choice unless you know that they're going to be small. Um, you, what we use, for example, in Lark is this seek and text types, which this is supposed to be sequence and that's supposed to be text. Uh, they are kind of ref counted versions of vec and string. Uh, and you can do some sub-slicing. They're sort of very simple ropes. I, I wouldn't really call them ropes. Uh, I guess a rope would be potentially a good choice or an immutable data structure. Um, I think there will probably be some experimentation around this to figure out the right choices. Uh, another kind of thing you can do is interning, uh, which we also do in Lark, which then sort of produces integers, which are very good keys. Um, but there's that brings its own complications that I don't want to get into at the moment, like how to, how and if to garbage collect the uh, interning so pools and so on. But just for um, just for people watching, so have you did you explain interning in the other video by chance? I did not. All right, maybe we can just kind of do a quick. What is what is interning? Interning means to bury. That's that sounds scary. Yeah. yeah. So so interning is taking a this uh, is basically when you have a, a canonical pool like a hash map. Um, so for a given value, you store it in the map and you associate it with some integer. Uh, and then you can just pass the integer around. Uh, and that's a very cheap thing to pass around. It's kind of like a pointer in its own way. Uh, but when you later want to read what the value is, you can use the integer to get it out from the, from the hash map. And a particularly good hash map for this is the index map trait, which is sort of a combination of a hash map and a vector. So it can give you an index back out that you can then use to index directly in. That's one version of interning, anyway. So we take a, a complicated structure, you stick it, say, in the database or into a, an index map, and then we get out just an integer value. And we can pass around the integer value. We can reference, um, we can reference this larger structure just by this integer value. And we only need to pull that, that big structure back out again when we actually need to have it in our hands. Otherwise, yes. we can just kind of refer to it by this integer. Most of the time, that's just fine. Yeah, and that actually bleeds a little bit into the strategies for reuse, which I think merits a, a bigger discussion. But I would just say that in general, when you're setting up these sorts of queries like we've shown here, you, you often will want to introduce some kind of indirection. Like, let's say you have a module in your compiler, at least, that has like a list of items in it. You could make a module, you could make a data structure that's like, let's call it the enum AST. It might have, the module might have the, a vector of AST nodes directly embedded within it. But you might be better off if you can finding a way to make the module have a vector of IDs and having a separate query that's like, given an ID, give me the AST. Uh, and the, the reason that you would want to do that is that maybe there are changes inside the AST, but like the, the list of IDs doesn't change, essentially. So the, so the module level looks the same, even if some of its contents change. And that way, you can get finer grained reuse, because only those derived queries that actually had to access the AST for a given ID care if the AST changed. So often with recursive structures, you'll want to set up a, set it up this way. And it's also um, so in the database, you might have um, like set the the ID to a, an updated AST, 
and the ID doesn't change, but the let's say you add new parts to the the structure behind that. The the new AST has has some more data in it. Right. So you just keep keep using that that ID and everything that uses that ID, none of those queries become invalidated because that ID doesn't change. Right. So so like to make this concrete, if we assume that the ID is some kind of path, let's say, and it could literally be a maybe even a, an arc path or something, then then this the value for foo, the module foo would be like a vector of this path foo bar, right? And the value for foo bar would be the fields. And so now if they change, if you change the fields of bar, you don't actually change the value for foo at all. Um, so yeah, I, 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 this stuff can get a little tricky and complicated. That's why I think it's, this is the idea of what you want, but actually realizing that this, um, I mean, and, and it's worth saying too, I mean, some of this is that salsa is so new, you know, we're still learning how to use it to its fullest potential. Some of the tricks that we're trying out may not be good later and some will learn new tricks as we go. This is just kind of like a snapshot of where we're at. Yep. That's right. I think the only thing in this list that I feel like might, we could talk about real briefly, maybe cancellation. So we talked actually, about par parallel patterns already actually, but yeah. Yeah, well, before we do that, so the on-demand thinking, um, I think it's good to drill into that a little bit, especially for people coming to Salsa and thinking about Salsa as a user, knowing that you should think about your query in these stages, just like um, Nico was showing earlier, where you have a query and that query calls other queries that allows you to kind of cache things and do them in steps to think about uh, rather than pulling large bits of data out of the database one shot to, to have it in that stage allows you to like, there's, like he's saying on demand thinking, like pull on the data up to the point that you need and then stop. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the challenges that I found with the on demand stuff is that, at least say in compilers, you often have something where it's like, in order to type check something, you, there's a certain amount of context that you need. Like maybe I, I, can, I could, for example, pull out an expression in isolation, like I have some function like this and I have let x equals 22 or something, something here. I could, I, could, I could maybe pull out this expression in isolation, but I can't really do anything with it until I know what the type of X is and, and that's determined by these other statements. So what, what you often end up with is, this, is this, this structure of queries where you start out very local and you kind of branch out to get your context. You'll have some outer queries that they will parse the whole file maybe and give you like the set of names that are defined or something, but they try to do the minimal amount of work. They're very shallow, kind of like we showed here. They just leave pointers for how to continue if you care about the details of this thing. Enough that you can then, then you can drill in on just the parts that you actually need in order to do that. So maybe you, you would find out, oh, the name X, I have a map that tells me where it's defined. I can find its initializer. And therefore, I'm just dependent on that. But if there are other statements in here, like a println, I never wind up asking for the details about this. And so it, then I'm insulated from changes that might affect it. That's the idea. But the practice, like I said, <laughs> I think that's to really getting into that and showing a good examples of it would, would be a good topic for future. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a bit of an art to it, breaking up your problems so that it's in these really good stages for your, for what makes sense for your project. Right. Um, one thing I want to add, or I want to come because it's directly relevant to what we said, is that the one of the nice things that back, the backdating technique lets you do basically is be a bit sloppy here. So you can have, we showed an example where we had the source file here and it's a very crude, very imprecise, right? It doesn't like break the source text into chunks or anything. So every edit is gonna change this key, which means every edit is gonna rebuild the AST, but that's maybe not so expensive, right? And then we find out that in fact, later parts of the program are insulated by this, the fact that the AST doesn't ASD doesn't actually change on every edit. And you might have even more finer grain queries like 
item names, which are which reads the AST and produces a list of names of items in the list, right, or something. And now the key point is, even if the AST changes, the names of the of the items defined probably for a lot of edits are not. So adding a field to a struct won't affect the struct's name, for example. Maybe item is not a good choice. Let's call it type names or something. So basically defining these levels of information lets you uh, make use of backdating so that even though you will execute up to a certain point, you won't get to the expensive stuff. Um, I'll take that out. All right. I'm ready to stop. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> that I, fear, good. I fear our listeners may be ready to stop too. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is good. I think there. Um, this is from a user's perspective. This is a great overview of of how how salsa is working with your project. Um, yeah, I think it'd be really fun to go, go in to talk about like how salsa itself works, but maybe we can do that in a separate video. Yeah, I think we should wait on that. But I, I like this format. We'll do more of these, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, cool, thanks again. Let me...